families have filed wrongful death lawsuits against the province. Now another inmate, Jonathan Hinook, died at HMP on November 6th. He was charged with first degree murder in the death of Regula Shuley. Police are investigating his death as a homicide. Meanwhile, in the case of the Labrador inmate, the Department of Justice and Public Safety is expressing its condolences to the man's family and friends, as well as the staff and inmates of the Labrador Correctional Center. It says pastoral care and mental health and addiction services are being provided and that cultural supports are also being offered. The department says once the police investigation is complete, it will launch an internal review. Anthony. Here now is Jen White. The premier says moving Carla Foote into a new job was an attempt to quell public anger over her appointment. But if the opposition reaction is any indication, the controversy just continues. Here now is Peter Cowan is on this story once again tonight and joins us live. So Peter, why did the premier decide to make this move? Anthony, it comes down to trying to listen to the concerns and do something to quell the anger that we saw all throughout the fall and balancing that with the fact that he says Carla Foote doesn't deserve to lose her job. So the compromise, moving her from the rooms back to core government and into an assistant deputy minister position. Here is how he explained the rationale to reporters this afternoon. Realizing this would be in the best interest, you know, the rooms, the best interest, of course, of Miss Foot. No one likes to see people go through those things. No one likes to see the rooms in this situation. So we had to find a solution. And this is the solution. She's back working in government. Other than that, as I just said, can anyone say that Carla Foot deserved to be without a job today for what happened here? Of course not. She, de she deserved, she deserved uh, to have a job and, you know, rightfully so. Now you'll remember two independent reports found problems with how government shuffled foot from a top government job into the executive director of marketing and communications at the rooms. Christopher Mitchell Moore at the center Thank of this you, had to uh, apologize and, and he's going to be kicked out of the House of Assembly for two weeks when it opens next month. But assembly. if you think that this move is going to quiet the controversy, well, not so fast, says the opposition. It aggravates people out in the public wherever I've gone. I, I went to a, a school and chatted with some people there this morning. I was at the Arts and Culture last night to a show. People are coming up to me and uh, they're almost obsessed with the inappropriateness of this favoritism to liberal insiders. Now, there was no competition for moving her into the job at government, but that is normal for deputy minister and assistant deputy minister's positions. They're appointed by the clerk and essentially by the premier's office. But these are supposed to be, and in fact, they're required to be non-political positions. The people in there can't have political involvement. And that's a contradiction, says the NDP, especially for a woman who used to be a liberal staffer and is the daughter of a former liberal cabinet minister. So what we've done now is we've taken a very prominent liberal and put them in the Office of Public Engagement, which ought to be very unbiased and nonpartisan. So I, I'm really confused about the rationale behind this move. Now, the reason that Ball was actually speaking today was a completely different issue. He wanted to give an update on rate mitigation, which was supposed to have a deal in place with the federal government by the end of January. He says it's complicated, talks are ongoing, and in fact, they're going to continue through the weekend. So, Anthony, uh, next week we'll ha we may in fact see a deal between the provincial and federal governments to keep rates low when Muskrat Falls comes online. All right, thank you. That's Peter Cowan live in our newsroom. Now, at that same informal news conference where Peter and I were this afternoon, the Premier admitted it's going to be hard to help people who lost out on wages during the state of emergency, or at least harder than he had hoped. Thousands of people lost out when the city of St. John's forced businesses to stay closed. Many didn't earn any income for that week, and yet they still have a lot of bills to pay. The government hoped to help those people through the federal government's employment insurance program, but now the premier says that program won't work, but discussions with Ottawa are ongoing. The EIS aspect of it right now is, is one that the federal government, they're struggling with and, and pretty much have come to the conclusion that it will be very difficult to use the EI program to support uh, to workers in this situation. You know, I realize that this was a difficult storm on, on especially low-income earners in, in our province and if there's any way that we can provide assistance and support in, in a, an extraordinary way, well, we want to do that. <laughs> 
sounds messy out there. Three weeks ago we were dealing with that blizzard, but now we're dealing with freezing rain and lots of it uh, for most of the Avalon, the Buren Peninsula, as well as uh, parts of the southern portion of the island. Big area of low pressure just on its way to the Maritime Provinces. This warm front's what's bringing that freezing rain, and it's going to continue to do so as we head through the night tonight, bringing some warmer temperatures in eventually as we head through the night. But freezing rain warnings extending all the way through to Port of Basque. We still have snowfall warnings for the interior and winter storm warnings up through the northern peninsula, as well as the straits at this point. Now, this is what I'm still thinking snowfall wise. We'll talk a little bit more about the timing, but the uh, heaviest snowfall still looking good somewhere between the Port of Port Peninsula up through Green Bay, White Bay. And then again, that freezing rain along the southern half of the island tonight. So I'll have all the details. We'll break down what's going to happen because the winds are going to pick up as well. I'll have those details coming up. Well, on a busy day with Rosie's, it's anywhere between four to 600 people come through the building. And a stormy day is no exception. Bad weather just can't keep business at this diner down. Now to an update that a story here now broke yesterday about students bringing knives or threatening to at a St. John's Junior High School. We reported that the RNC prevented a possible knife attack at Leary's Brook Junior High and had identified students as well as teachers who'd been targeted. Well, the English school district is taking issue with here and now story. In a statement today, it said the CBC used inflammatory language, which misrepresented the facts of the matter. As well, the district confirmed that police did meet with the school to discuss an anonymous tip that students with knives in their possession had threatened a number of teachers. However, the school board says that at no time did police or administration feel there was a credible threat to teachers or to anyone else. Now, teachers are not permitted to do interviews with the media about this, at least not on the record. And we know the principal of Leary's Brook Junior High did write parents saying our report raised, quote, unnecessary concerns. But he also told parents that an investigation found a student with a letter opener and a small pocket knife. The parents were not informed of this until after our story aired last evening. Jim Din is an NDP MHA and education critic. He's also the former head of the teachers union in this province. My experience with it in the past is that the uh, district had a, um, a habit of downplaying the threat. I would often get calls from teachers uh, saying that they were very much concerned, that the issue was probably a lot more serious. And I had that experience myself even. We would often have teachers who were afraid to even reach out to the NLTA because they figured that they couldn't speak to it. Uh, so in many ways, I look upon the district, yeah, there, there, that maybe this is, uh, maybe it's a lot more serious than they're letting on. I would point this out, that if you or I had decided to walk in through an airport security with a letter opener or a pocket knife, I think it would be met with a lot more seriousness, especially if we were trying to, to sneak those on aboard a plane. More than one teacher has expressed gratitude for the fact of uh, making comments on this and bringing it to light. To other news now, the owners of the processing plant in Black Duck Cove say they will not rebuild. Gulf Shrimp says there are too many fish plants on the Northern Peninsula and not enough shrimp to keep them all going. The Black Duck Cove plant was destroyed by fire last May. The company says it has spent the past six months trying to decide whether to rebuild, and it says it can't justify the 15 to $20 million investment because of a decline in shrimp quotas and a poor stock outlook. At the time of the fire, there were close to 80 people working at the plant. The company is advising them to apply for jobs elsewhere within the operation. Well, after a whirlwind trip abroad, a Deer Lake man says he won't be boarding another plane anytime soon. Marcel Brake was aboard the Air Canada jet that was forced to make an emergency landing in Madrid earlier this week. Here now's Troy Turner has his story. For Marcel Brake, it was the trip of a lifetime, joining family in a foreign and exotic country. Beautiful vistas, adventures around every corner, and architecture unlike anything he's seen. His flight home from Spain, however, was equally memorable, but for different reasons. Right when it took off, all we could feel was a shake, and then we could smell smoke. The landing gear of the Boeing 767 malfunctioned, and a piece made its way into an engine. 
For the next three hours, Brake and 127 other passengers circled the Madrid airspace, burning fuel until the plane was light enough to attempt a landing. Well, nobody was panicking, so that was good. Yeah, uh, I was in shock at the time, so yeah. All I was thinking about on that airplane was, are we going to land safely? They did. The plane eventually landed without incident. Brake had been traveling with his dad. His father had even watched him pass safely through security in Madrid before boarding his own flight across the Atlantic. It wasn't until Andy Brake landed in Boston that he learned what his son had been through. I didn't know until after the fact, so, you know, thank goodness I kind of didn't know while it was taking place because that would have been pretty scary for, for myself to experience, to know that he was up there circling, uh, you know, under those conditions. It wasn't until much later that Brake felt the seriousness of the situation. He called his parents to ensure everyone knew he was okay. I was like thinking that I'm glad I was safe and I'm glad that we were all safe on that plane. Yeah, yeah, and that, uh, that I was glad that we all got a second chance. While Marcel Brake was grateful to arrive here at Deer Lake Airport safely, he won't be getting on a plane anytime soon, saying there are no trips planned in the foreseeable future. Troy Turner, CBC News, Deer Lake. A woman whose passion for helping others, especially vulnerable women in this province, has died. Fran Innes was 95, and she was known for her decades of advocacy work in justice and equality. She served on city council in St. John's in the late 1970s, and she helped create Planned Parenthood in this province, and she helped to establish children's libraries. But Innes was perhaps best known for her work in helping found the Status of Women Council as a voice for women in this province. One of the main problems that we're dealing with now is the problem of unwed mothers who are on welfare. They're becoming a, a larger number in our society, and uh, they're literally living uh, below the poverty line. Why should society pay for that decision, though, if they deliberately get themselves pregnant and they want to play house? A large percentage of uh, uh, single parent mothers are not teenagers, they're not children, they're 20 years of age and older. And, you know, why should they uh, uh, try and, and survive in, in their mother and father's home? Uh, and often they are from low income uh, uh, status and um, they, they, you know, the home can't support more people. And they need some independence and they need some, and they should have some right to a decent life and, and to break the poverty cycle and, and have a chance to bring their children up. You know, I, I really cannot buy the argument the people on welfare enjoy being on welfare. It's demeaning, it's degrading. You never have enough to, to last from one uh, welfare check to the next. It's just a terrible way to live. Nobody would choose that if they had any options whatsoever. They don't have any options. Groceries are expensive. Everything is expensive. Everything has been hit by inflation. And the government cutbacks in the restraint program right across the country uh, are hitting some areas hard, and the hardest hit are always the ones on the bottom. Certainly committed advocate. Well, let's get back to the weather. As snow turns to ice pellets and then to freezing rain tonight, people in Gander are seeking shelter from yet another storm. And our very own Garrett Barry decided he'd skip the snowy streets and hide out. Can't blame him. He's hiding out at a popular Gander restaurant instead. Take a look. Another one of these? I've got a better idea. Well, you have to dig through the french fries and green peas in order to find your fish underneath, so... Welcome to Rosie's, a great place to grub up before the work begins. Exactly, that's why I came. You know, I've got to get my snow blower ready, pick up some extra gas, because uh, when they say you're going to get 5 or 10 centimeters of snow in central Newfoundland, it could very well be 50. So uh, you want to have your energy up. Now, if you're anything like me, the last thing you want to do tonight is shovel. My plan is to hole up in my house and wait for this whole thing to pass. I think these guys make a lot of food. That's what makes Rosie's what it is. Rosie's is known for its huge fortunes. And why not? Newfoundlanders are hardy people and they love big plates. There's some big reservations tonight, but the real rush was yesterday. Because Newfoundlanders, they need their storm chips. 
maybe everybody is still working through it. Yeah, I think so. This is going to be a late night snack tonight, I think. <laughs> and all of this got to come from somewhere. And through our summer months, we go through 20,000 pounds of potatoes every month. A farmer's field. That's a lot of these. Yeah, our supplier uh, holds a place in the warehouse just for Rosie's inventory, which includes our potatoes. Their pitch to you? Just look at this. And the owners say it's not so bad to miss a snow day if you're one of the 24 people working here. You only God knows. We, I always says we should be on A and E uh, as one of those uh, entertainment shows right. because what's sitting in this kitchen is unbelievable. But at the end of the day, when they go home, they're like brothers and sisters. You can't argue with that. Garrett Barry, CBC News, Gander. Just changing the face of the campus. Amazing. It's awesome. There are now more international students here at Mon. Students like Solomon from Egypt than there are citizens in the town of Bishop's Falls. You get to see people from everywhere in the world. I've been here for so long. This is, this is like home. I'm Terry Roberts, and we'll tell you the story of the internationalization of our university. That's Monday on Here and Now. Because if we don't act now, we're probably going to lose the building. It provides like a beautiful artistic experience for the town. So I guess we're getting a church. This weather update is brought to you by the NL511 app. No, before you go.
check road conditions, highway cameras, and the provincial plow tracker with the NL511 app. I'm not sure if you looked around parking lots today, but I noticed a lot of cars have their uh, windshield wipers out as if they're antenna away from the windshield. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Don't yeah. get me started. There's a oh. little bit of a controversy. No, it's not a big deal. There's a little bit of controversy on whether you should do that or not. Okay. But uh, mine are up, so. All right. Story. A story for next week. Maybe. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, people concerned about the ice. Of course. Yeah. We're seeing lots of it too. A little bit of everything in the forecast, or at least through the day today. Yeah. I know. It was every time I looked outside, something different was happening. But uh, I didn't know what to ask you about because there's too many questions. There's a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hopefully, I have a lot of answers. All right. Go. <laughs> Let's take a look at what the satellite are, and radar is saying right now. So we've got that area of low pressure approaching the maritime provinces. Out ahead of that, we have a warm front, and that is why we are seeing that mix of precipitation. We saw that start off as snow today quickly changed over to ice pellets, although briefly and then mixed with freezing rain for most of the afternoon today. Um, and we are starting to see things now. It's about it's freezing drizzle at this point right now, but we still are seeing that warm front lift across the province over the next little bit. Uh, temperatures still well below zero right now for most areas, uh, but minus one for St. Lawrence, minus three for Port Basque. And as you head towards central, those temperatures are much cooler. You're going to stay on the cold side of this warm front, which means it will be snow for you up through Labrador. You're looking at temperature around minus 22 for Lab City, minus 17 for Happy Valley Goose Bay. So showed you these warnings a little bit earlier. We do have those freezing rain warnings all the way uh, along the south coast, eastern Newfoundland, as well as the Avalon with winter storm warnings extending up through the straits. Uh, as we head through the night tonight, and that's because the snow is actually going to pick up. You didn't see much snow earlier today, but it's going to ramp up and already starting to do so uh, tonight. Still looking at somewhere between 30 to 40 centimeters for most of us. Now pay attention to this pink line. It's going to track a little bit further north. That's as that warm front continues to lift a little bit further north. So you're going to see anywhere really in that pink, the mix of some freezing rain and potentially some ice pellets as well. Won't be significant in nature through central. Uh, again, the most of that freezing rain will fall down through the southern half of the Buren Peninsula as well as the island, uh, the Avalon. And then we'll see a change over to rain, and that's because those temperatures are really going to bump up as we head through tonight. Here's where you should be sitting. So about nine degrees uh, at some point tonight, and then uh, your winds are actually going to pick up as well. So we're looking at easterlies along the coast, 40 to 70 plus kilometers per hour. I say plus in those exposed areas. And then uh, the winds are going to shift, which is also why we're going to see that temperature climb. So from easterlies to southwesterlies uh, with, uh, you know, winds excess of 80 to as much as 90 kilometers per hour overnight tonight. And then even more so as we head through the day tomorrow. This is the St. John's metro area. Um, freezing rain overnight tonight, jumping up to nine. See those temperatures staying above zero right into uh, Saturday morning with those winds. The strongest winds it looks like right now could be 100 to 110 kilometers per hour. Uh, even 130 kilometers per hour isn't out of the question. Then we note that temperature drop uh, tomorrow afternoon. So all of this is going to freeze with that potential force and flurries as well. So that wind warning very much in place all along the south coast there. And then uh, again tomorrow as we hang on to those cooler temperatures, everything's going to change back over to snow. So here's where you'll be sitting minus uh, single digits through the day. These temperatures will continue to drop as we head through the uh, afternoon and evening hours uh, for the uh, eastern portions of the island. And then again, those winds are going to stay strong as well. So I have a few more things that I want to talk about as far as we head through the weekend. I'll have all those details coming up. Thanks, Ashley. Disappointing news for local sports fans. This afternoon, basketball star Carl English announced his retirement. And it came in the form of a tweet. This tweet. English said he never thought the day would come, but that the St. John's Edge will be moving forward without him. English isn't ruling out a future collaboration with the team, but said for now he is wishing the Edge a winning season this year. Now, this may not come as a shock. The 39-year-old has been in a dispute with the owners of the Edge for some time now. The star shooting guard and general manager has had no involvement with the organization in recent months. English had previously told CBC that the Edge would have to, quote, do right by him and meet contractual obligations before he would consider playing again. We hope to have more information on this story in the coming days. Carl English's retirement ceremony is planned for February the 23rd.
It's making the connection here is people see Carla Hood as a liberal. They don't see the mother, they don't see this young woman who works hard every day. Premier Dwight Ball faced reporters today who had questions about two controversial stories about job hires. Here are the questions and the answers. As you saw earlier this evening, Premier Dwight Ball called the media to the Confederation Building today to talk about rape mitigation, but reporters were anxious to ask him about two controversial stories from this week. Carla Foote's appointment to an executive job back at government after leaving the rooms, and the lucrative contract handed to a former deputy minister who left government to become an oil and gas consultant for twice the pay, as well as some big perks.
Can you explain why an oil and gas consultant who lives in Scotland deserves a $36,000 a year housing allowance for a home in St. John's? Well, you know, the, the contract there that you're talking about with Gordon McIntosh is one that was negotiated between uh, Jim Keating and with, uh, with Gordon McIntosh. And, and Greg Mercer. And uh, no, the, the contract was not negotiated with, uh, with uh, Greg Mercer. So last week I put out a statement that outlined, you know, the, the, uh, my comments around what happened with this, uh, with this position. Uh, <clears throat> there's been response to that. You guys have had a lot of questions about that this week. So like you, I had questions as well. So I spoke with Jim Keating, I spoke to Gordon McIntosh, I spoke to Minister Cody, and I spoke to the Chief of Staff. So as we've been discussing and negotiating with the federal government on, on rate mitigation, we're also having these discussions as well. With the aim of? So, uh, so th for those people I've had uh, conversations with, there is an agreement, there is no question that everyone agrees that Gordon McIntosh was an ideal candidate for the job of, uh, for the new oil and gas, expanded role of the new oil and gas company. That would be uh, when you look at supplier uh, service development and promotion of our oil co in Newfoundland and Labrador, that uh, no one argues the credentials and the ability That's true. of Gordon McIntosh That's true, to but do he, that chose job. To live in, he chose to live in <coughs> Scotland, right? Usually if you give you $36,000, it's because you're gonna live here and pay your taxes here. He wanted to be closer to his family. Yeah. Why, my question, Premier, why does he deserve a $36,000 housing loan? Well, as I said, the contract uh, with, uh, with uh, Mr. McIntosh as was uh, discussed and negotiated with, uh, with Jim Keating. So you think it's okay? I, I'm not saying it's okay. I have questions about these contracts as well. And this contract right now, as of effective of February the 1st, is now open for review. Would it be cynical for someone <coughs> to suggest that the exact time that you're under scrutiny for this McIntosh job and however it came about, all of a sudden, Carla Foote leaves the rooms because both of these looked like really good jobs that were arranged for people by your people. You know, Anthony, that, that is so unfair and so untrue. You get public perception. I could give you countless numbers of examples that are people that work in public service. The only, what's making the connection here is people see Carla Foote as a liberal. They don't see the mother, they don't see this young woman who works hard every day. They don't see that person because you know she would have been connected to the LG or so on. That's, that's what's making this, you know, the, the, the public discussion that we're having with this. But there are many people out there. But that's why, that you, should have been, that's why you should have done more due diligence when you gave her the job. So, I would, so what you're suggesting is, is that because she would have been a liberal that she don't deserve no, the job? No, I'm saying because we, of her relationship with her mother. That's the, re that's the reason this has become a story. It's not because of us, it's because of the way you handled this. The fact that she's a Lieutenant Governor's daughter, Premier, with all due respect, I would suggest to you, required the greatest diligence to put her in the rooms. You could have said, you know what? I know Carla, I trust Carla, I need her at the rooms. This would have been a two-day story. Instead, well, you said nothing to see here, nothing to see here. I, it's not what I said, it's not what I'm saying here. What I'm saying is, is that when we pick people to go out and work within the public service, you know, for me, we have lots of good people that would probably support you know, some other party. And probably, that's the way it is. You know, in our society, we have a, a small group of people that want to contribute. And right now we're talking about, you know, Ms. Foote, which I believe is, is uh, you know, primarily because, you know, they're making a connection to me or to a mother, which is really unfair for the person that we're talking about. You know, this, uh, this, uh, this has been reviewed. You know, the, the report is out there. And, you know, Ms. Foote will come back, you know, to work within government. And she will be, she'll be a suitable candidate. She's a suitable candidate and she'll contribute. Well, from the Premier to the Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau has arrived in Ethiopia to start his eight-day visit in Africa, and he was greeted by the Prime Minister in Addis Ababa. Trudeau will become the first Canadian leader to take part in a session of the African Union. He's going to meet several African leaders at that event and attend discussions on gender equality as well as the environment. Trudeau hopes to garner support for Canada's upcoming bid for a seat on the United Nations Security Council. And more than 200 Canadians are back on home soil after being evacuated from the epicenter of the coronavirus outbreak in China. The evacuees say the trip went smoothly and they're glad to be back in Canada despite being in quarantine at a military base in Ontario. Uh, we're doing really well. We are uh, much relieved and relaxed to be here. Uh, and we're settling in um, and trying to overcome the only major hurdle left, which is 
getting over jet lag. Um, at different speeds. Megan Millward and her family were among the 176 passengers on board a Canadian evacuation flight that arrived early this morning. After disembarking, they were taken by bus to a hangar for processing and for the first of their daily health checks. They're going to be held in quarantine for two weeks. Early this afternoon, a second plane landed at the base with 39 more Canadians on board. Ottawa is organizing another airlift of Canadians from China on Monday. To be perfectly honest, I still find it surreal that I'm in any movie, so... Many of us know him as Des from Republic of Doyle, but Mark O'Brien has done much, much more since then. Will his latest project bring home an Oscar on the weekend? They're the Time in the Hall dancers, and they've brought square dancing back to the Eastport Peninsula. Sunday at noon and Monday at 7. The Oscars are this Sunday, and one of the movies nominated in several categories features a familiar face in this province. Rhetorical question. Like you may remember him as the lovable character of Des Courtney on the CBC show Republic of Doyle, but Mark O'Brien's star has been rising steadily ever since. He's been busy over the past few years, starring in many successful TV series like The Last Tycoon. Please don't shoot. And the show Halt and Catch Fire. And he stars alongside Kevin Bacon in City okay. on a Hill. He's also the lead in the biopic movie Goalie. And he stars in the recently released comedy thriller Ready or Not. In 2016, he played Captain Marks in the film Arrival, which was nominated for Best Picture at the Oscars. And this Sunday, Mark O'Brien will be watching to see if his second Oscar-nominated movie brings home a statue. He's featured in the Netflix movie Marriage Story, starring Scarlett Johansson and Adam Driver. The film is nominated for six Oscars, including Best Picture. And Mark O'Brien joins us now from New York. Mark, congratulations. Hey, thanks so much. Yeah, it's really exciting. How does it feel to be part of another Oscar-nominated movie? Uh, I don't believe that it's happening. Uh, it's, uh, it's cool. It's, it's, a, it's a real treat because I just love movies so much and 
and uh, and to work with people that you like admire and you love their stuff. So when I walk down the street and I see like a poster for Marriage Story, I I often forget that I'm like, oh well, wow, I'm in that. So um, it's 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 kind of surreal. I to, to be perfectly honest, I still find it surreal that I'm in any movie. So because <laughs> I I just wanted to be an actor, and I was like, oh wow, like I can't believe they let me do it. So um, it's it's exciting. I don't want to give anything away for people who haven't seen Marriage Story yet, but you play an important and very memorable role. What did you think when you first found out that you landed that part? Oh, it was wild. I, um, I had been a fan of Noah Baumbach, the writer-director, for years and years. So I, I met him and, and it went well, and it wasn't for another like two months. So when I found out, I was like, oh, I thought that they didn't like me. Um, and I, I was just blown away when I saw it too. I was like, oh my God, like this is so well done. Like it's, and the acting by Scarlett and Adam is so incredible. And seeing you acting in scenes with Scarlett Johansson and Adam Driver, what was that like? Huge stars, oh right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're massive. <laughs> you kind of forget, you're like, oh yeah, there's Kylo Ren, right. Oh, and they're like, you know, the Avengers, you're like Star Wars, like there's a lot going on there and on top of it, they're great actors. And I gotta say, like, full honesty, they're the nicest human beings in the world. Very normal. So what are you gonna be doing this Sunday? Uh, this Sunday, <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna be watching by myself in New York with my cat. Um, my, my wife, Georgina, is shooting a, a, a TV series in Puerto Rico for ABC. So she's gone, uh, and I, I'm, I'm in New York for season two of City on a Hill. So I, I can't be in LA, so I'm gonna be watching on the couch right over there by myself with a marriage story banner that I'll be cheering on. And you know, it looks like 2020 is going to be another very busy year for you. Can you kind of give us an idea of what's coming up? The next year is, is really exciting. I, City on a Hill, will, season two will air. And I, I just did a movie with Alicia Vikander, who's an amazing actress. Um, and this great writer director named Justin Chan. It's called Blue Bayou. It's about immigration in the States. It's really smart, really, really beautifully told. And I'm also writing for the next couple uh, things I have in development. And there's a couple movies that I'm kind of like, um, a few things I'm just kind of trying to decide on um, that would shoot in the spring and stuff. So it's good to have options like that. All right. Well, we will be watching out for you for sure. Thank you so much for making time for us today, Mark. And congratulations once again. Thanks so much. Nice talking to you. Well, the Oscars is Hollywood's biggest night of the year, and the red carpet has already been rolled out for the stars. From Los Angeles, here's entertainment reporter Eli Glasner with his predictions on this year's winner's circle. After months of campaigning and all of those screenings, well, it's all come down to this, the 92nd Annual Academy Awards, and who's going to take home the golden guy himself? There he is, Oscar, in all his shiny glory. So let's start taking a look at some of those acting categories, beginning with the, well, it, it's just going to happen. You know it's going to happen. Brad Pitt, the way he has just so subtly campaigned for the award. Well, campaigning, but not campaigning, but just effortlessly being there in the right place, saying the right thing, and that's exactly what's going to happen on Sunday night. Mr. Pitt will win for Best Supporting Actor for his performance as the stuntman in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And he's got to thank Tarantino for writing a role that matches his charisma as perfectly as the Hawaiian shirt his character wears. Now let's move on and talk about Best Supporting Actress, Laura Dern. I mean, this is someone everybody in the industry loves her and what a wonderful role she played, the divorce lawyer in Marriage Story, where she even stole scene after scene from Scarlett Johansson. So there is your winner for Best Supporting Actress, Laura Dern, in the Netflix movie, A Marriage Story. And let's move on and take a look at the big acting categories, beginning with the winner for Best Actor. Now this is a tight race with a lot of really powerful contenders, such as Leonardo DiCaprio and Jonathan Price, but in the end, it's gonna go to well, the guy who played the Clown Prince of Crime, Joaquin Phoenix, he has this ability as an actor to just slip into the skin of the characters he plays, and that's exactly what he did playing Arthur in the movie Joker, a prequel of how that Clown Prince of Crime came to be. And the thing about acting and voters, well, they like those roles where you really can see 
that transformation, which is why Joaquin Phoenix will win that category, but also why I'm predicting Renee Zellweger will win for her performance as Judy Garland in the movie Judy. I mean, on the one hand, she sounds like Judy Garland, she looks like Judy Garland, but also there is this connection between Zellweger's life and Garland's life in that they both have seen kind of the ups and downs of the business, and I think voters will really respond to that. Finally, two big prizes to predict. Best Director, it's going to go to the director of Parasite, Bong Joon-ho. And finally, Best Picture, it is a tight race, but I am predicting the war film 1917 will win for Best Picture at the Oscars. Eli Glasser, CBC News, Los Angeles. The weather update is brought to you by Belltone, your partner in better hearing. Well, if you're like me, you might have a strategy when it comes to your driveway. Mm -hmm. And Ashley threw everything at us with some help from... But we had everything. I didn't snow. throw it at okay. you. I no, told no. you it was coming. <laughs> she only brings sunshine. No, but we've had everything, right? Some snow, that's some right. rain, some ice pellets. So I'm sort of thinking, okay, what do I do with my driveway into the weekend? Because that's my weekend plan to try to rediscover my driveway. To find it. Yeah. Well, if you haven't found it today, it's just going to turn into a sheet of ice tomorrow. So, okay. yeah, the temperatures are going to drop. That's the plan anyway. At least I don't that's blame what it looks you. Like. <laughs> that's what it looks like. Let's just take a, a quick look at the forecast for tomorrow. I didn't get to show you what was happening up through Labrador, although it's quiet, but cold up through Lab City uh, around minus 24. But you can see those temperatures. So we're going to go from eight, nine degrees tonight back down below zero uh, for the south and the east. So everything that is going to fall or that is falling, even though it's ice right now, uh, will melt a little bit and then refreeze through the day tomorrow with that potential for some flurries. Uh, another potentially five centimeters for areas along the coast as well, along the west coast. And then those winds again, some southwesterly 60 to 100 kilometers plus. So here's the timeline for those winds. This takes us through uh, to uh, tonight. So you can see those strong winds all along the south coast, hence those wind warnings. 
going to continue to stay strong into the first half of tomorrow, even into the afternoon, uh, and then eventually those winds will ease. They're going to stay out of the southwest, though, anywhere from 50 to about 70 kilometers per hour. And then even through the day on Sunday, we're going to see some pretty breezy winds, 50 to 60 kilometers per hour uh, for the majority of the island. Uh, and then again, staying in that that uh, wind shift. So as far as weather wise, we're looking at uh, on Sunday, things are going to quiet down. Finally, we're going to see some continuing probably to see some flurries on the west coast as well as the south coast. But otherwise, we should see a mix of sun and cloud for most of us uh, with some flurries in the first half of the day along the northeast. Up through Labrador, quiet as well as a ridge of high pressure is in place, but we will see some flurries move through and then uh, that'll uh, continue pretty much on Monday. So here's where you'll be sitting temperature wise back down to those minus single digits, mid minus single digits right across the board. Minus nine for Corner Brook kept those flurries in there for you and then sunshine uh, for the most part up through Labrador. Minus 15 minus eight uh, for Happy Valley Goose Bay, minus 18 for Nain and Gander. Uh, you're going to be sitting around minus eight tomorrow. So we do still have those uh, wind warnings in place, like I mentioned, but as we head uh, through the day on Monday, the next one's going to move in. This one, not too significant. Looks like we'll see it. They'll move uh, quickly through some snow, potentially some rain again as we transition from some rain, uh, snow to rain for eastern portions of the island. And then Wednesday, another one moves in, so it's going to be you know, one after another for the next couple of days, unfortunately. And then uh, as we continue into Thursday, those temperatures will be, uh, well, much colder. We're going to stay all snow, it looks like at this point. So here's where we'll be sitting uh, temperature wise over the next couple of days. You can see a little bit of a roller coaster. Uh, same thing essentially for uh, the rest of the island. So uh, just wanted to share this weather photo with you. Isn't a great shot? Isn't it? Yeah, it's glamping, I'd say, at this point. Parks Canis, nice though. What a spot. I already told you exactly where it was. I hit the wrong button. But That's okay. There you go. It's Friday. Take it's, it easy it's on Friday. us. It's <laughs> Friday.
Time to see who's celebrating birthdays and anniversaries. James and Maude Delaney in St. John celebrated their 60th wedding anniversary on Wednesday. And a happy 56th anniversary today to Winston and Stella Andrews in Cornerbrook. Happy 50th anniversary on January 31st to Benedict and Eileen Leonard in Southern Harbor. Happy 50th anniversary yesterday to Brendan and Bernadette Doyle in the Codroy Valley. Happy 53rd anniversary to Charles and Linda Fillier in Bear Need. Happy 95th birthday to Madonna Ryan in Gander. Happy 91st birthday to uh, Effie Late in Deer Lake. And Esther Keeping celebrated her 96th birthday on Monday. Esther's from Ramia, now living in Port of Basque. Happy 100th birthday on January 27th to Elma Carter, formerly from Greens Pond, now living in Paradise. And happy 64th wedding anniversary on Tuesday the 4th to Ralph and Selma Piercy in Kellegrews. Happy 50th anniversary to Brian and Joyce Hatcher in Port of Basque. And happy 61st wedding anniversary to Seymour and Bessie Campbell from Cooks Harbor. Happy 57th anniversary to, on Tuesday to Marie and Frank Duffett in Catalina. Happy 64th anniversary to Pat and Blanche Ryan in Aquathuna. And a 50th anniversary greeting for Tom and Eva Chislett in Creston South. They celebrated on Tuesday. Happy 90th birthday to Grace Chafe in the Goulds. She celebrated on January 26th. And a happy 94th birthday greetings to Winifred Strong in Jackson's Cove. Happy 92nd birthday to George Kendall in Cornerbrook. On Monday, John Moore in Mount Pearl will turn 91. That's John in front of a 1929 Cadillac. 1929, the year John was born, of course. Happy 55th anniversary to Heber and Phyllis House in River of Ponds. A happy 51st anniversary tomorrow to Pat and Stan Lundgren in Babels. On Wednesday, it was a happy 60th anniversary to Gordon and Verda Pike in Portland. Happy 55th anniversary to Anne and Ron Snook in Clarenville. And Bill and Judy Lafitte from Port of Port East celebrating 50 years together today. Happy 90th birthday to Margaret Halliburton in Lewisport. She's from Exploits. And happy 91st birthday to Clayton Short in Cornerbrook. Happy 90th birthday on Monday the 3rd to Elvina Burry in Ottawa, formerly from New West Valley. And happy birthday to Irene Chambers, who will celebrate her 94th birthday on Sunday. Lester Pittman in Deer Lake turned 90 on Monday. And a happy birthday to Leona Day, who turns 90 tomorrow. Happy 98th birthday today to Olive Rowe in St. John's. And happy 56th anniversary greetings tomorrow to Dawn and Pauline Allen in Cornerbrook. Next Wednesday, Rose Whiteaway from Little Burnt Bay celebrates her 90th birthday. She now lives in Lewisport. Yesterday, Bob and Minnie Lane in Catalina celebrated their 57th anniversary. And a happy 59th anniversary to Cecil and Veda Mead, originally from Port of Basque, now living in Mount Pearl. Arch and Jean Hoskins from Boswarlos celebrated their 63rd anniversary this Sunday. Also, Sunday, happy 52nd anniversary to Harry and Anita Critch from Charlottetown. And also, happy birthday to Albert Warren. Uh, he's from Cornerbrook. Yeah, and his uh, granddaughter said that he's recovering in Western Memorial Hospital. So, happy birthday, happy Albert. Birthday. <laughs> okay, now, the camping thing? Yeah. You got, have you done winter camping? Well, you probably have done oh, winter I've done camping. lots yeah. of winter camping. That's, Who am I was, asking? Of course. <laughs> it was what? Eight Weather months. person in, yeah, that's right, in the Arctic. Eight months in the sub, well, sub-Arctic yeah. in St. Saint, um, Saint Catharines. Jeez, that's where I'm born. Um, <laughs> okay. It's been a long week. There is a lot going on. It sure is. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, can we take a look at that picture? Absolutely. Again? Let's All do right. it. All right. Let's see this. So there we go. So Terra Nova. The glamping. Glamping. Yeah, John. But, I mean, you probably could have figured that out just from the Parks Canada but little look, thing there. Look at the amount of snow on what I think is a bench. It looks that way. Right? Hey. Loads of snow. Terra Nova, great place to go snowshoeing, cross-country skiing, play around in the snow. And uh, if you haven't tried it there in the winter, now they don't groom the trails for skiing, but you can cut your own path. Hmm. You have the place to yourself in places. Gorgeous. It just hasn't been nice enough to get out there. From here. <laughs> From here yeah, is the I only know, problem. But the, the snow quality of Terra Nova always, be well, I shouldn't say that. I'm going to upset people in the Avalon. But chances are the snow in Terra Nova Better than the snow here, certainly now. That's what I keep what hearing. Okay. Yeah, after all this rain and ice pellets and everything. So we doing everything. the uh, ice chipping weekend? That's my plan. I don't know about you, but. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> I know an address I can hand you. You can come over your chipper. And, uh, yeah. 
Nah, I'm good. Anyhow, <laughs> uh, be careful if you're going out there, especially in the St. John's area. You know, there's a lot of ice and it can be slippery. Mm -hmm. Don't want you to hurt anything. So just take it easy out there. Have a great weekend and uh, we'll see you again on Monday. Good night. Good night.